negative images of the Chinese took hold. They were a race apart, a lesser breed, and fair game. By 1900, the American opinion of the Chinese had not improved. A mystical cult called Boxers had led an anti-Western uprising of angry Chinese peasants. They killed hundreds of missionaries, their families, and their followers. 2,000 American Marines joined the Western powers in crushing the rebellion. Now, the victors would divide the spoils. As the imperial powers jockeyed for position, the internal struggle for a new China began. In 1911, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, educated in a mission school and deeply influenced by American ideas on government, became the first president of the republic. We hailed him as an Asian George Washington, and another dream of winning China was born. America would help lead the awakening giant to democracy. Millions of dollars poured in to build schools, libraries, and hospitals, and a new wave of missionaries answered the call, promoting social welfare rather than salvation. Got my bag, I got my reservation. They included the parents of James Thompson who grew up in Nanking during this period of American optimism toward China. Growing up in China, China seemed to me where everyone lived. My Chinese ama was my best friend, my dragoness guardian. She guarded me from evil spirits and she fed me delicious delicacies. I loved it. The smells of the streets, the songs of the street vendors, the charm of the Chinese people, even the little rickshaw kids who teased me and taunted me because I had a big nose and a pale face. They called me Little Foreign Devil, but they laughed and we sort of danced together. It was, it was a joy. The Chinese also felt a special affection for Americans because of the missionary effort. Their hospitals and schools helped thousands. But Western political ideas from Thomas Jefferson to Karl Marx were bitterly debated by a new group of student activists like Timothy Tung, who graduated from the mission school in Shanghai. American missionaries, you know, communists used to call that as a, a religion or missionaries as a tool of imperialism. But uh, the way, I, when I think back, I think uh, good things and bad things all came together. You know, without that kind of a new modern education, uh, we would not have been uh, so much aware of uh, things going on around us, you know. A great struggle to improve the lives of a fifth of the human beings on Earth was underway. For all our good intentions, most Americans knew almost nothing of the hard life of the Chinese peasants. They did not understand the crushing poverty that forced peasants into practices like infanticide. America mistook China's destitution for cultural weakness. But then came a sympathetic novel written by the daughter of missionaries. Pearl Buck's best-selling book, The Good Earth, erased the image of the Chinese peasants as cruel and superstitious portraying them as heroes fighting the turbulent forces of history and nature. In the Hollywood version, studio executives thought so much of the Chinese, they cast a Caucasian in the lead. The man who saw the peasants as the key to China's future was Mao Zedong, a revolutionary little known to the West. Mao and his Communist Party had been driven underground by Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, the successor to Sun Yat-sen and the leader of an increasingly authoritarian government. Since the mid-twenties, his secret police, the Blue Shirts, had murdered thousands of leftist intellectuals, labor leaders, and students. But America saw Chiang differently. Chang had converted to Christianity. 
and married a wealthy, beautiful woman educated in America. To us, he seemed the ideal leader. Chang's greatest supporter and promoter in the United States was Henry Luce, founder of Time, Life, Fortune, and the March of Time. In 1937, when Japan attacked China, Luce began a campaign in all his media for an American rescue. To both the military leaders and the people of China, the greatest single hope for survival and victory is America's pledge that in their fight for freedom, the United States is and will remain their friend and active ally. Time marches on. Nine and a half months before Pearl Harbor, Luce urged America to enter the war. He envisioned victory and saw the future as an American century. Asia expert and author Frank Gibney started as a war correspondent for Time and later got to know Henry Luce while writing editorials for Life magazine. Harry Luce was the original sentimental imperialist. You had to look at his background to understand how deeply true this statement was. He was born in China. His father was a missionary. He grew up in an atmosphere where onward Christian soldiers uh, was uh, a routine song. Uh, to Harry, Harry Luce was never a man who could uh, use the word crusader with a smile. He meant it. But he also was a very sentimental man. He really had a feeling for Asia. There was not a spark of bigotry in that man. He loved the Chinese the way he loved his own people. mass bombing from the air with a helpless civilian population. America finally joined China's battle against the Japanese in 1941 after Pearl Harbor. Why are these innocent Chinese men, women, children to die beneath the hail of Japanese bombs? The brutality of the Japanese attack outraged the world. Hollywood helped mobilize American public opinion. The Japanese became the stereotyped enemy while the Chinese, once ridiculed, were now portrayed as a noble, peace-loving people. We should know what sort of people they are. Well, in all their 4,000 years of continuous history, they have never waged a war of conquest. They're that sort of people. We had great expectations for our alliance with the Chinese. But despite generous military backing, Chang's troops fought poorly against the Japanese. But the communists, who had survived his earlier attacks, mustered a guerrilla army in the north that was hurting the Japanese. President Roosevelt ordered a mission to Yunnan to visit Mao Zedong to decide whether the communists should also receive military aid. The foreign service leader was John Service, the son of missionaries who grew up in China and spoke the language. You had a whole group of very obviously gifted people who'd been... Uh, who come through a, a long struggle with the, with the Guomindang the war had been going on since the mid twenties, and uh, they'd survived guerrilla war and the long march. Uh, they were capable, committed people. The mission recommended military aid for the guerrilla army to hasten the defeat of Japan. Service reported that Chinese communists were charting their own unique path, and that it was in America's interest to foster a dialogue. They were past a point of having dictation from Moscow. They'd rid themselves of a long struggle of dependence on Moscow. And they were determined to hang on to what they had won, this great territory during the, they won during the war, and the popular support they had, which is gonna be the basis for their future. Coming from what we had thought of as being a rather insignificant refugee group hiding away in North China, this was sort of staggering to see this sort of complete, assured confidence these people had. America had invested too much military and political capital in Chiang Kai-shek. President Roosevelt turned down aid for the communists. Madam Chiang Kai-shek, First Lady of China, is welcomed to Washington by Mrs. Roosevelt, First Lady of the United States. The Generalissimo's Wellesley educated wife, Madam Chiang, was his most powerful lobbyist in Washington. I can also assure you that China is eager and ready to cooperate with you and other peoples to lay a true... For people like uh, Madam Chang or all these smooth-talking Chinese who'd gone to Harvard and would come in and assure him that they were Christians and they, uh, they loved democracy, 
uh, and uh, 